The 17 News at Sunrise podcast is brought to you by Aspire Counseling Services. Call 829-7300. This is 17 News at Sunrise. Good morning. It's been nearly six years since a former elementary school principal's husband was shot to death in an orchard off Enos Lane. This morning, she's expected to go to trial, charged with his murder. What to expect as we follow this high-profile case. Arvin officials and political activists add their voices to the fight for safe drinking water. What lawmakers are trying to figure out is how to make for it. We'll tell you what many are suggesting coming up. Road construction projects ramp up. We'll tell you about the long-term closures coming around town. This is Tuesday, May 28th, 2019. Good morning, 5 a.m. Great to have you with us. I'm Maddie Jansen alongside Alex Fisher and Kevin Shred. Starting off maybe a short work week for a lot of people out there and the last week of school for most kids in Kern County. So you know what that means for a lot of kids around the county? Hmm. And teachers, hmm. feet up, celebrating the Celebr- end of a great school year. Hey, Almost there. <laughs> Almost there. We'll start out in the upper 50s, partly sunny, and then throughout the afternoon, I'm expecting mostly sunny skies. We'll be right near 75 degrees by 3 o'clock. We're at 43 degrees in Tehachapi, uh, northwest wind at 10. We'll also start out with some clouds in the 40s, and then this afternoon, expecting the 60s, and we should clear out and be looking at mostly sunny conditions. It's an issue facing millions of Americans and Californians. Access to clean, safe drinking water. Earlier this month, we told you about a study possibly linking cancer and California's taps. Water systems at the highest risk serve smaller communities like those here in Kern County. Lawmakers are now debating how to fund the fix. Today, farm worker rights leader Dolores Huerta will join Arvin Mayor Jose Garola and people affected by the issue to rally and urge lawmakers to figure out a solution. They support a proposal by Governor Gavin Newsom to establish a safe and affordable drinking water fund. It would secure a sustainable funding source bringing permanent relief to the 1 million Californians who don't have access to safe drinking water. Supporters want lawmakers to approve the funding by June. You may remember several weeks ago the state gave a 14.3 million dollar loan to the city of Arvin to fix an arsenic contamination problem. Right now wells in all six districts have arsenic levels above state limits. Long-term exposure is associated with increased risk for diabetes, skin disorders and cancer. The project will give people living in Arvin access to a safe supply of drinking water, something they haven't had for more than a decade. It is 5.03 and the trial of a former elementary school principal accused of killing her husband is set to get underway this morning. Leslie Chance is charged with murder and the death of her husband, Todd. You may remember he was shot to death in an orchard off Enos Lane in August 2013. Police arrested Chance days later, but prosecutors did not file charges. Officers arrested her for a second time in December 2016, and she was charged with his murder. Since then, the case has been postponed several times. The trial is now set to begin at 8.30 this morning. 504 now. The man accused of opening fire inside in Southern California synagogues expected back in court today. One woman died and three others were hurt in the attack at a synagogue in Poway last month. The 19-year-old accused gunman has pleaded not guilty to charges of murder and attempted murder. The DOJ is also charging him with more than 100 counts of federal hate crimes. Each of those counts is eligible for the death penalty. This week, state lawmakers are expected to move forward with one of the most controversial pieces of legislation this season. AB 392 aims to change the standard for when police can use deadly force. Lawmakers have debated the bill for more than a year, but now the bill's authors, civil rights organizations, and some law enforcement groups are backing it. The bill changes the language in the law and would allow police to use deadly force only when, quote, necessary instead of the current standard of, quote, reasonable. Police groups are now supporting the bill because it eliminated requirements for police to use a list of alternatives before using deadly force. One of the bill's most vocal critics in the legislature and a former CHP officer says he's encouraged by the changes. It's a dramatic change and maybe even to the point to where uh, we may be able to support it as a law enforcement uh, community. Um, But I'm still evaluating, still trying to see, but it is refreshing to see that this looks like it's, it's a dramatic shift. Governor Gavin Newsom recently said he supports the new bill. Assembly members and senators have until Friday to pass or reject bills that originated in their respective chambers. A new round-the-clock closure is starting in downtown Bakersfield today. The 24th Street Improvement Project is planning on closing East Street between 22nd and 23rd Streets. 
This section of road is scheduled to stay closed through at least June 4th, that is next Tuesday. But crews are planning to open up D Street before this new closure. And a major closure is set to begin tomorrow night on the Westside Parkway from 9 p.m. till 5 a.m. All eastbound lanes on the parkway will be intermittently closed through at least one lane, though at least one lane will stay open during the road work. Closures are also scheduled on Truxton Avenue between the parkways on and off ramps. In addition, the eastbound on-ramp from Mohawk Street will be closed for two months so the construction team can build a second lane. Hi, I'm Scott with Aspire. I want to personally thank Kern County for trusting Aspire with being a part of your family's recovery. At Aspire Counseling Services, we take this opportunity very seriously and would be honored for your continued support. Call us today. Welcome back here at 516. Another plane carrying dozens of migrants from Texas has touched down in San Diego. But now there are concerns over a growing number of flu cases. The arrivals are part of a Department of Homeland Security plan to alleviate pressure at overwhelmed processing centers. But the number of migrants arriving with the flu keeps going up. Just this week, public health officials say they've seen three new cases, bringing the total to 35 since DHS started flying migrants to San Diego. County officials say the rigorous screening process and attentive medical staff have been key in helping identify and treat cases early. The first big trial in the opioid crisis is set to get underway today in Oklahoma. The state claims consumer products giant Johnson & Johnson and several of its subsidiaries helped create a public health crisis. Oklahoma says the companies did that by marketing highly addictive opioids and misrepresenting the risk that comes with taking the drug. This trial could reveal documents and testimony that show what the companies knew, when they knew it, and how they responded. The state has already reached, a se has already reached several settlements with other drug makers. One in four women experience some form of domestic violence, and survivors are often left to deal with the trauma years after it happened. James Dynan explains the first step survivors must take to begin to address the trauma. When I was seven months pregnant, he did push me during an argument. Uh, I called a cousin back home in Georgia, and he encouraged me to leave. Longtime TV anchor Dee Griffin left an abusive marriage nearly eight years ago, but still suffers from the trauma of domestic violence today. I saw a couple arguing in a parking lot last week, and it brought back memories. Psychotherapist Ayana Johnson says that is not uncommon that survivors of domestic violence suffer long term. So post-traumatic stress disorder is a disorder that is caused by a traumatic event that someone survives. She says that one can see, hear, smell, and even feel from touch something that can trigger memories of violent experiences. Many studies have shown that there are mental health effects as a result of intimate partner violence, such as clinical depression, as a result of feelings of hopelessness, anxiety, suicidal ideation, and even attempts. To work through these long-term effects, both Griffin and Johnson say survivors must first acknowledge they need help. By telling my truth, I help others, but I continue to help myself and realize it was not my fault. For today's Health Minute, I'm James Dynan. There are several numbers you can call if you or someone you know is in an abusive situation. First, if it's an emergency, always call 911. You can also call the Alliance Against Family Violence and Sexual Assault 24-hour crisis line. That number is 327-1091. The National Domestic Violence Hotline is 1-800-799-SAFE. There's also the Family Justice Center, a one-stop shop for anyone looking for help. The center is located at 2101 Oak Street in Bakersfield. Back here at 522, the Canadian government is one step closer to approving a new trade agreement with the U.S. and Mexico. Yesterday, the country's foreign affairs minister introduced a motion in the House of Commons. It opened the way for the formal presentation of a bill to ratify the treaty. The U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement would replace the 25-year-old North American Free Trade Agreement, otherwise known as NAFTA. But none of the countries involved have taken legislative action to approve it. This all comes just days before v Vice President Mike Pence goes to Ottawa to push for ratification of the deal. The U.S. recently struck deals to lift tariffs on steel and aluminum imports from Canada and Mexico. Doing so removed a major obstacle to approving the treaty in Canada. The U.S. is Canada's top trading partner, taking in 75% of its exports of goods.
The unofficial start to summer is here, and chances are you're already planning your sunny getaway. But before you book, a new report finds most of us are missing out on profitable credit card rewards. Mary Maloney has a closer look at the do's and don'ts in today's Consumer Watch. Vacation mode on. And if you weren't planning to use plastic to pay for summer travel, think again. According to a new survey by U.S. News & World Report, 61% of surveyed Americans don't have a travel rewards card and may be missing out on big rewards. Of those who had rewards travel credit cards, about 49% earned $1,051 or more. Uh, in the past year. Experts say follow these rewards cards do's and don'ts. The first do, find a rewards card that fits your lifestyle. If you drive a lot, get a card that gives you cash back when you gas up. And if you like to entertain, a card that gives you money back for dining may suit you. What are your spending patterns? Do you spend a lot on groceries? Maybe you need a credit card that offers grocery uh, rewards. Another must do, research which card gives you the biggest sign up bonus. And here's what to avoid. Don't leave money on the table. Keep track of all your rewards programs to make sure you redeem points before they expire. And finally, the biggest no-no. One thing you want to avoid is putting your vacation expenses on a credit card if you don't think you can actually afford a vacation. For Consumer Watch, I'm Mary Maloney. The 17 News at Sunrise podcast is brought to you by Aspire Counseling Services. Call 829-7300.